So, I think we can start. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jofi. I'm going to talk to you about how to organize Drupal camps. This is the time to leave to the other session, which is by Fabian and Antonio about configuration management. So, you can still go and no, okay. So you can stay. Um, so welcome. As I said, I'm Jofi. Um, I work as a project manager at Chappers in Hungary. Um, you can find me on Twitter. And I'm going to tell you some things about how to organize Drupal camps. Uh, one thing before everything, I'm not a professional. I just have experience, so you don't you can take seriously what I'm saying here, but these are mostly advices. Um, about some of my experiences, I uh, lived in Saget for 10 years where I started to build a startup community in 2012. And uh, we basically did meetups. We organized meetups in every month and we put together a nice community. And that was my first time that I actually started to organize techie events because startups are basically techie stuff. Um, then I uh, started to, I was uh, involved, I got involved in organizing Drupal Dev Days in 2014 in Saged. And since 2014 I'm also organizing Drupal Atom, which is in, most of you know, in Hungarian international uh, Drupal camp in Hungary. And now we're organizing Drupal Iron Camp. Uh, this year it's going to be in Prague. We wanted to do it last year in Budapest but we cancelled it, so I won't talk about that, but I can tell you some details about how you can decide not to do a camp in the end. And I also organized some other things in Hungary, like Drupal Weekend in Budapest. Uh, I am responsible for organizing uh, Budapest Drupal user group meetups and also Budapest DevOps meetups, so I do many things. So, um, how many of you have already organized a camp here? And who is planning to organize a camp, like, next time? Okay, yeah, all the time. So, yeah, it's an important thing, because why are you here then? Um, so, basically, Drupal camps are events, like, the name Drupal camp is describing several types of events that are organized by usual local communities, where people come together and do sessions and do sprints and everything. Um, I think that it's, uh, organizing Drupal camps is a very good way to contribute. For example, me, myself, I'm not a coder, so I don't do the, all the exciting stuff that you guys do. Um, but this is my way to contribute organizing. I think it's really important and useful because this is where people come together and do their own stuff. So, and yeah, this is why I'm sharing my experiences now. I'd like to, when we started to uh, organize our startup community in Saged, that was really kind of like an idea, the Heureka idea that basically organizing something out of nothing is like doing a startup. It's like building something from scratch. Um, because th there are similar ways to do it, like the camp is basically your product, you have to put together a team, you have to get money for it, you have to find internet, there are so many things that are, are the same that you need to develop on the way and you might need to change things. And I think that if you follow the way how the startup companies grow and, and build and, and get things done, it's an interesting analogy. Um, because first you will need, you will have a product, which is your camp. Um, there are, like, first you will need to define what kind of camp do you want to organize, local Drupal user groups or smaller camps like for 100 people, 150 people, or larger camps like Drupal Dev Days for 300 people, or maybe summits, there are various types. And you also need to define your target group. If you want to do it for developers only, like Dev Days, you want to do it for uh, business people, like CXO days, um, or just management people, or just translators, whatever, there are many options. You will also need to figure out what language you would like to use, because it defines the number of attendees, usually. In Hungary, for example, we don't really speak that good English, so for us it's always tricky to put together a session, uh, a camp, for like only in Hungarian, or only in English. For example, our international camp is in English now, but we did it for like four years in Hungarian only because it attracted more people, but now we are happy to do it in English because it makes sense. 
Um, so yeah, you, ne you need to figure out how many attendees you want to have, and it, yeah, it depends on many other aspects. And it's really important, I think, to make it scalable. So you can set a low and high range of, for example, attendees that will define many things, like how much money you will need in the end, how big venue, how much food, how much like internet bandwidth, whatever. Um, but you need to make it scalable. So you want to set an average, like an ideal number of attendees, and then you need to figure out how to make it larger or how you can downsize it. But of course, it's like you will see in the long run. Um, you will need to figure out the focus and the format of your event. Uh, you, for example, Dev Days, it's mostly about sprints, but we have sessions here. You can do only sprint events. You can have only session events. You can have boffs. You can have summits. There are many, many, many options. You can uh, organize pre-event events, like, for example, extended sprints are a really good example of that. Most of the camps, I believe, have extended sprint days before or after, or and or after. Um, yeah, you can focus on sprints only, um, and you will need to yeah, figure out how to do the slots and breaks because it depends on all the format. But when you decide to which kind of event you want to have, you will see how you end up with all everything. So as just like I said, it's a startup analogy, I think it works. Because then you will need money. Before I start to go into every detail, you will need money. I think it's like money comes from sponsors and from the tickets from the sold tickets. Um, it's a huge financial responsibility to decide to do a camp. There will be someone who will sign the contracts in the end. Um, and they, so yeah, it's important and it's huge responsibility to decide to do a camp. But you can do it, like you can scale it up. This is the MVC, this is like a new term, I guess it didn't exist before, the minimum viable camp. We all would like to have really pretty nice donuts, but I think it's like if we have at least one donut that you can eat in the end, that's the best. Um, you, I suggest if you want to do a camp and you do it for the first time, I suggest to put together like what you would like to have, like in terms of what you really need to have to make your camp happen. Like you need the venue, you will need probably, you will need internet, you might want to have food, but it's up to you. So it doesn't really matter. What you put in your MVC, you probably will need to change it if everything goes well, and probably if everything doesn't go well, you will need to change it. Um, but first, I think it makes sense to focus only on the MVC side of it. So as I said, the money comes from two parts, the tickets. The tickets, the way we define tickets, for example, for our camps is tickets cover everything that you need by default for your camp, like the venue, some basic catering, not necessarily, but the basic catering and internet, because these factors are the most important. And we try to do some profit. If we can do like 5% profit out of the tickets, that's really good. I know that there are camps who don't care about the profit, they just do their camps and if they come to zero in the end, they are happy with that. We try to make some money. Um, you can also do a free event, but I think that there are usually 25, 30 people who drop out like after registration. So you sign up people, they don't need to pay for your event, and then they don't come in the end. Um, I know that Batcamp is doing a really good strategy. They, you need to pay for the ticket, and if you don't go, you cannot get back your money. But if you go, you will get back your money, which means that it's some kind of support of the event. Um, but they, they do a lot of things differently, so maybe it's not the best uh, example in this case. So you will need early, regular late bird prices. You will need to figure out what is the optimal price for your camp. It's really hard to uh, decide in advance because it's really hard to say how much money people would like to spend on the camp, but in time you will figure it out. Um, yeah, and the who gets free tickets thing is there because it's an advice. If you organize a camp, be clear about who you're going to give out free tickets, in my opinion. It's important because speakers and, for example, volunteers are not always sure if they're going to get free tickets in the end. And it's kind of awkward to ask, even if, like, and it's, it can be a very weird discussion. So be clear who's going to buy it, who's going to need to buy their ticket or not. Yeah, the other part of the money is coming from sponsors. You will need someone who will take care of the sponsors in many ways, like 
discussing with them, agreeing with them, signing the contract, preparing the contract, signing the contracts with them. Um, and you will need to put together a very realistic sponsorship package list. Um, you will need to set realistic goals because sponsors don't like it. I don't think it. I know that there are camps where there are too many sponsors, but usually every camp suffers of not having enough sponsors. Um, and it's really lucky to have a camp where you have every money and it's together and you can spend it on all your event and make it a lot better. But for this, you will need to know your sponsors. So I think that the communication part is very important. If you want to have, if you know that you're going to do a camp, I suggest to talk with your sponsors in advance and ask them what they would like to pay for, what, how much money would they be interested in paying for the camp? Because there's a huge, like it's serious what you value as something useful and something important in your camp that's probably not very tempting for your sponsors. For example, Drupalot on our camp is a kind of good example. We give beer coupons to people at the camp, during the camp, but it's like no, not too many sponsors would like to pay for that kind of package. They rather sponsor sprints or healthy food or coffee. So yeah, you need to be smart there. Then you will need to have a team. This is our team for Dev Days. Um, the four people on the top, we organized it, um, and Christoph is not on the picture, sadly. Uh, but the two other guys, uh, they, were, uh, they took care of the internet, and she is the daughter of the photographer. But she was very important when she was there. Um, so you will need a team. You will need to uh, find leaders if you need to find more. And you will need to find core helpers that are going to help you put together your event. This is not a one-man show, so you don't have to do it by yourself. And you probably won't be able, because you will need people, for example, for financials. So someone will need to find, sign the contracts. In our case, I'm doing sponsorship management and marketing stuff. I don't sign contracts, but we make the decisions together. Um, and so you will need to figure out who is doing what. Uh, it depends, of course, on of the size of the event. So, for example, we are doing an event for 150 people. We are only two or three people in the team. But if you can do many things and multitask, that's fine. I suggest you have a bigger team because it's useful and you're not going to be burned out before it actually yeah, comes together. Yeah, so, and you will need to communicate with these people regularly. Be used Slack, for example, is the best way to get in touch and stay in touch with each other. We also have regular calls every week. We discuss what happened the last week, what we need to do this week. And yeah, and it helps a lot. So communication is the key. I always say, no matter what we are talking about, communication is the key. It's key. It's important. You will need volunteers. Um, I will add some uh, URLs in the end of my session. Uh, I recommend to see uh, Stephanie's uh, session from Drupal Camp, DrupalCon New Orleans. She talked about how to recruit and retain volunteers. Um, volunteers are really important because they help you a lot during your event. And you need to careful, like, you will need to be careful how you treat the people around you, no matter if they're volunteers or the core helpers because they are dedicating their own time and it's time spent like taken away from family from other entertainment stuff and it's really precious so yeah the timeline um uh is this is just an example uh about how to yeah uh draw a timeline for yourself there i will also add the link to uh desio's uh document here put it together about, it was Drupal Camp in 2013 in Austria, Vienna, uh, about what you need to do like six months before the event, five months, blah, blah, blah. It's very useful. Um, but first, you will need to find a date for your camp. If you don't know drupalcall.com, go and check it out. Um, they pull all the camp dates from uh, events.drupal.org and it's really useful to, like, you can find camps in your area, you can find DrupalCons, you can find different types of events, and you can find which dates are populated and which don't collide with other camps. And then when you have the date, you can start fixing your deadlines. Um, and I suggest you count backwards. For example, if you have the event, you should define or decide what you want to do two weeks off, uh, before it starts, one month, three months, etc., uh, Because it will help you make it everything easier and it will help you coordinate the team and it will help you. Um, it will give you really hard deadlines sometimes, but you will need to stick to them because your event has already a date and people start buying tickets for it. So. It's never easy, but try to stick to them. 
Okay, so the following slides will not be in the order of how important they are. It's basically, I'm going to cover many things about, how, about what you will need to prepare for. Marketing is one of it. Uh, if you want to do a camp that never happened before, I suggest to do a brand workshop where you can figure out what you would like to do on your camp. For example, we did that with Iron Camp. We didn't really know how to... We didn't have... Uh, we didn't fix a slogan for that. We knew that we had an idea that we wanted to do a camp like that, but we didn't have an agreement on anything like that. So we put together a, a brand workshop where we discussed everything. You can also do that. You will need a website, of course, where you can put your schedule on, where you can sell your tickets, where you can add your attendees, where you will need to display your sponsors, which is, of course, very important. You will need to uh, define the social media channels that you're going to use. I, as far as I experienced, Drupal people are not really fond of Facebook. Uh, most people use Facebook for tagging pictures with people. I think it's fun, but everybody use, mostly uses Twitter because it's easy, it's quick, you can find, define hashtags, you can search for hashtags, is the best way to do it. But you can, of course, use Facebook, that's not an issue, just a suggestion that Twitter is more popular. You will also need a newsletter that you can put on your website to, for people to sign up and you can send emails, you can advertise your sponsors there, you can tell people what they need to be prepared for, send out tickets, blah, blah, blah. Newsletters are important and very useful. Again, and you will need some offline and online marketing or design materials. For example, you will need to, someone to design the badges, you will need someone to uh, design the schedules to the doors and everything. There's so many things. I didn't list everything, of course, we don't have time. If someone is interested, how much materials, what kind of materials do you need for a camp? Find me after the session and we can, I can give you a list. And yeah, stickers. Stickers are very important. There are two kinds of people in this world. One who like hate stickers and have nothing on their laptops. And the other ones are like this guy here. Um, stickers are really cheap and they are a really good marketing material to spread the word about your camp, especially if you have a nice logo. Yeah, but people love stickers, so. You will need a location, you will need a venue, and you will need to uh, find some kind of accommodation to the people you expect for your camp. Uh, if you have various options, for example, in a country, uh, or for the same type of event, for example, Drupal Dev Days, I think it's uh, going on since Seged. Uh, there is a comparison board where everybody who is thinking about organizing dev days in their country, they uh, put together some information about the size, what kind, how much money they're uh, planning to spend on an event, uh, what extra do they have in mind, how much budget do they plan to uh, make the whole event from. It's easy to compare because in the end, it's, it's not just the money that decides, it's like there are other options as well, for example, the venue. Uh, but it's really easy to, to have a comparison between several options. Um, universities can be used as venues, hotels, event centers, conference halls, it's up to you. Um, it's really tricky to find a good venue, Depend, it depends of course on the size of your event. Uh, we did it in hotels, we did it in event centers, everything can work, you, ne you will need to make it work in a way. Uh, but you will need to check, for example, room availability. If there are side events, you will need to check with the side events. For example, university is really good because there are, like, naturally so many rooms. You can easily find uh, enough space for sprinters as well. In uh, Dev Day Seged, we had a whole event center, which was really nice because everything was together. That was only us who attended the, who could go into the venue and who could be there. But there are many other options as well. What is, I think it's important, it should be a location that's easy to access by public transport because nobody wants to travel two hours to get to somewhere like in the same city or whatever. Yeah, because it's like people want to be there early, people want to go home then, blah, blah, blah. Location is very important. And food and coffee. So when I said you need to put together like set low and high goals, I think catering is a tricky thing. Um, you can decide not to have anything, like no food, no drinks, no coffee. But many people love coffee and drink something in the breaks. Um, for Iron Camp, for example, we had three options, like have snacks in the morning, snacks in the afternoon, all time, like coffee, unlimited drinks. Uh, you can also decide if you want to have a lunch in the venue. It depends on your budget. 
you will need to see where you can cut or what you can eliminate. So if you have a lot of money, catering is usually, I think, the most important and most, most like, yeah, it's really expensive. For example, in Iron Camp, I think the catering in the end, uh, when we uh, decided to, before we decided to cancel it in the first plans, catering was twice as e expensive than the venue itself, and the venue was really expensive. So, yeah, you will need to figure out. Everybody loves coffee, so if you can have at least coffee in your catering, that's the best, because everybody is looking for coffee. I've never been to a Drupal event where people didn't look for coffee all the time. But then you will need to check special dietary needs if you give out food. These are just important things that you need to be pay attention to. But for example, in this picture where Schnitzel is very happy, it was in Bratislava. We had really good sandwiches. That was really awesome food. It was also for lunch, but these were huge sandwiches. And, and everybody was really happy because we had, I don't know, two or three. And everybody was full. So for example, we didn't need hot food there because we had sandwiches. That was, this is how they calculated it. You will need combinations, and then you figure out how much time you, uh, how much time, no, money you have for that. But if people are hungry, they solve it there in their own way. I don't know how much you see. This uh, is from Dev Days in Seged. People got hungry in the afternoon, and they figured out that they would like to have pizza. So 72 people came together to order pizzas. This is a spreadsheet for it. Someone started it. And you can see there are many people adding their options. The pizza place was really happy after ordering. Yeah, I think they did it like that was the one single order that covered everything for their day. Um, so yeah, people are very smart and they can figure out how to get food. Catering is like if you have some options in the venue itself, like a bar or something where people can get food, that's the best because then people will do it by themselves. Internet. Um, it's maybe not that obvious for everybody. We had camps in Hungary where we didn't have internet because we had a contract saying that, yeah, we are going to have everything that we had last time. And it turned out that there was an extra contract for the Wi-Fi. So we didn't have a co contract for Wi-Fi and there was nobody in the building who could turn the switch on. But people survived. There was only sessions and yeah, we had local coverage, so that wasn't a problem. But you might want to discuss it with the local providers if they can do like, Usually, if you go, for example, to a hotel or you go to an event center, they are not prepared for this amount of gigabytes of data going through the line. Um, in Sagad, we almost had to cancel our event like a few weeks before because it turned out like it was a serious threat. We didn't, of course, and we, we figured it out, but it was a serious threat because in the event center, it turned out that they had no clue about how much internet do we will we need for 300 people. But if you ca calculate with like 150% of the attendees that you expect in the end, I think that should be fine. Everybody has their own devices, and but you can still ask them to use only one Wi-Fi per person at a single time. But it's important, of course. If you can test, you can test it before. I know it's hard to test it. Like it's, you can test an ideal bandwidth, whatever. Um, but I just suggest to do it to make sure everything is as it is. And if you have the chance to have someone to constantly supervise what's going on on the internet, you can do that. Again, in Sega, this is a heat map. Uh, it doesn't really show on the screen, but there were two guys from Cisco. I just saw them on the picture. They were uh, always there in the venue, and they uh, supervised everything. And they knew what was going on with the internet when we had issues in some rooms, and then they fixed it. And then we had issues in other rooms. They fixed it. If you have someone who can take care of it, that's the best, especially if you have an event in, in a place which is not, like, by default, don't have that amount of internet. Then, speakers. Uh, speakers are also really important if you want to have session slots. Um, you need to set realistic deadlines and wait for people to submit their own proposals. It's really hard. Um, and it's not always happening as you expect, uh, because people don't really, I don't know, not everybody likes to talk about what they do on stage, see me. Um, but you can always reach out to speakers. So if you want to have, uh, want to cover some topic and you think that your attendees would be interested in, you can always reach out to speakers directly and ask them if they want to do it. It works for us. It, 
at Drupal Auton, um, and we have the we have really great speakers. Some of them are like this is not their first time doing their uh, sessions there, but they're doing it, so we can fill uh, all the slots. You it depends, of course, on the number of submitted proposals, how many slots you want to have. Um, but I really suggest to reach out to people and ask them or discuss with them how they could do their sessions, if possible. And sprints. We, you all know what sprints are. You all know why they are important. I think that having a sprint is extremely useful because it gives so much energy. And it doesn't matter if we are before releasing Drupal 8 or after Drupal 8. There are so many people all the time at Sprint, and people love it. When I, before I, uh, we did Saget in 2014, I remember we were talking about it with Gabor Hoichidet. I was like, come on, who would stay in the venue until 11 in the evening and do the sprints? You will see, you will see. And yeah, of course I saw, because this happens. So yeah, I didn't know, now I know. And now I also know why people love to do that. So organize sprints. Documentation is important, is useful, um, but it's also op optional. So if you don't have money to hire a video team or hire someone or ask someone to take pictures, there are always people who take pictures. So in the end, you will end up with very good photo materials. Um, but photos and group photos are really nice to look at. Uh, if you check Eventifier, um, I'm not sure if you need to, s I probably you will need to set up your uh, Twitter account before that, but you, uh, it collects all the posted tweets, for example, with all the images and everything. And it's really nice to look back and you can check what you probably missed when you were or working on your event at your event and didn't have time to t check everything on Twitter. Um, but I think the documentation is nice and especially people like those people who go to sprints, they don't really watch the sessions, but they might want to listen to a session afterwards. So, for example, at DrupalCons, a lot of people go and stay in the sprint rooms and watch the sessions afterwards because it makes more sense. And yeah, they can work together. Um, when the time comes, you need to be ready. Uh, these are just a few things that I mentioned. Um, before, like you will need to get ready with a lot of things when you are doing your camp or you are a few days before. You will need to get the reg registration desk ready, which is seems kind of like obvious. It will get messy. So, for example, the, these nice lines of badges they will not stay like that. I, in my experience, the registration desk is the most untidy place of every Drupal camp, like sometimes, because people leave their stuff there and they, you will need to put those away. So you will need someone at the registration desk who tidies up everything. You will need to find, you, well, you can check with the volunteers, you will need to find someone uh, to double check the speaker setup. Like, the guys are doing it here pretty perfectly, that we have someone for every room. Like room monitoring, everybody's checking the cameras, everybody's checking the microphones, everybody's checking the slides um, because it's needed. And there are always some emergency situations when you will need an extra adapter or whatever. You will need to coordinate with your volunteers. Uh, and then you can get your event happen. This is just one thing your event is happening. I don't think that I am not going to talk about it because the events happen the way they happen. Uh, if you're interested, we can talk about how events happen, but I think that if you get to this point, you will be pretty sure what you will need to do during the whole thing. Um, you will need to enjoy, try to enjoy. I, I think Claudio is hating me now because I told him many times, you sh you shouldn't, nobody should be freaked out. Everything will be fine, the attendees will be happy, because attendees are always happy, and in the end, everything is just good as it is, so don't worry, don't worry. I think it's useful to do a retrospective. I've heard of many camps where the people didn't do, and I asked them why, and it wasn't obvious for them that it's useful to sit down and discuss, because retrospectives are a way to be honest with each other and discuss what one's not the best or not the ideal, what could have been better. Um, and you also will need to put together a report, for example, if your camp uh, received funds from, for example, the DA, they will need to have a report of how the event went. So um, retrospective discussion is very useful to put together memos of it. And in the end, you will have a nice retrospective. And then the next year, you can do it maybe better if you want to, or if you need to, or do it the same way just as it is, because it was really good. Um, 
it was basically the part where about the Drupal camps. I'd like to talk a few minutes, just one minute, about uh, what we are doing now, because as I said, I don't do anything, not don't really do anything else in Drupal. I organize camps. That's my thing. Uh, we started an initiative. There are many other people like me in the community, I know. And we uh, started an initiative at the Drupal Con, at Drupal Con New Orleans at the community summit with some people. Uh, we want to put together a knowledge base for Drupal camp organizers where like, everybody can add their information or their thoughts, whatever, about ticket prices, how they set ticket prices, how they find venue, what they find useful, uh, what's important to know, whatever. Um, we have a form there. If you already organized a Drupal camp, it would be nice to, uh, I would be happy if you could go there and fill it out. Um, that's GitHub page, that's our page where we start, we will start getting together all the information. Uh, we are at the phase of collecting people who are interested in talking this, about this, like, in a regular way. Uh, and we would like to build it into a community hub. So there is, I don't know, a Slack channel, and if I need to know something, then there will be someone who will be able to answer it. So every contribution matters. If you have experience, you're very welcome. And to the end, some literature. Um, if you want to read about different topics, I suggest to go to these pages and check everything one by one. The first one is Gabor's uh, report from uh, Dev Day 2014. It's a 20-something pages long document, but it's really useful. And we put together it after our retrospective meeting. It co covers everything, like we did, what we did well, what we didn't do well, what could have been better. Um, I think it's it's just like a basic thing. It's useful. You can find some useful information in there. Um, the second one is uh, the volunteer uh, presentation by Stephanie. Um, she's talking about how to recruit volunteers and how to uh, keep them and what to do with them, basically. Because not everybody understands why volunteers are good or useful and what you should do or what you couldn't do or what you shouldn't do with your volunteers. Um, it's a 45 minutes talk and it's really useful, I think, so go and check it out. The third one is the Camp Survival Guide by Josef. Um, it's a really detailed and really useful stuff, so you should also read that. And the fourth one is basically uh, the groupsdrupal.org URL. Um, it's a very basic thing, it, but it covers many, many things and it's really uh, useful if you want to understand the whole, like, if you want to know how to start with. I think it hasn't been updated for, like, years now. Uh, and I'm seriously thinking about doing another version. This is the second one so far. But it explains a lot about why you need to do, I don't know, why you need marketing, why you, what Drupal camps are, what are the different kind of camps, blah, blah, blah. And that's it for today. Thank you so much. Um, and just like I said, the sponsors are good and they, we need to treat them well and we need to love them because they bring everything together and they make it happen. Uh, they also make it happen. So thank you so much for the sponsors who help Drupal Dev Days make better. Um, and yeah, that's it. Let me know if you have questions. <laughs> questions? No questions? We can talk about it after. There will be a long break. You want to? So what we do at our camps is we basically, we agree in the beginning when we start organizing it, how much time everybody can put into it, and we try to stick to it. So I don't push everybody. I try to ask everybody nicely if they could do more, if it's needed. It's not needed all the time. There are phrases like, I don't know, six months before the event, you will need probably need less work. But before you update the website, you will need, I don't know, two weeks of more work. It's always like this. Uh, we try to be as clear as possible and we try to not to be angry if someone doesn't have the time. We try to figure out how to solve the problem and not just, yeah, we, have to, we need to find a way to figure it out. And the thing is that with Drupalton, we don't have too many people working on it, so it's kind of easy. It's like three of us. 
and others are just throwing in their ideas. Um, but for bigger camps, I think it's if you have more people in, on the board, it's better because you can distribute it better. So you have two people or three people who can update the website, that's great, and you don't have to rely on one people only. But it's really hard. But you need to be clear what who should be doing what, and you need to set, that's why you need to set the deadlines. Because if they like, okay, I should do the website, but until when? Yeah, it's always tricky. Actually, no, I don't have. Uh, we drop out on everything is like, um, so that's the biggest thing that I'm doing for years now. And it's similar to Iron Camp. We are thinking I we need I have a checklist in my head. With Drupal and everything is almost like copy pasting. Not everything, but now that we are moving it to a different city, it's a little bit different. But the whole like the whole from zero to I don't know hundred level, everything is similar. Um, there are some things that we have checklists about. Uh, we have a very big and confusing Trello board, but we understand it. Um, there are some things that we know that we need to do um, and we need like yeah we have some basic checklist but nothing special I actually I want to put it together for this knowledge base because I know that it's important I just have it in my head at the moment but I know that it's important because it's not that clear for everybody yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, we we wanted to do Iron Camp in Budapest, in Hungary, and uh, we decided to cancel it. And it was mostly because the financial responsibility was too much. We had, like, we had a really nice venue secured, but we didn't sign the contract because uh, we were not sure if we could put together enough money for the camp, and we were not sure if we could raise enough money from sponsors uh, to like, be sure that we can actually do it. That was not a good idea. Um, this is what we didn't do, just like I said, that you need to figure out was the MVC. Um, and we messed it up, kind of. So we needed to cancel, but we're doing it this year in Prague and we do it like a totally different way. We are in different kind of venue. We do it, yeah, everything is kind of different. The concept and the idea of the camp is the same, but we are smarter now, so we learned. You need to know when you have to cancel. I think that that was the best what we learned from it, that we learned what was the moment when we had to say no. That was, yeah, basically it. I think that the best tip, I think that the best tip, I, and honestly, that's the only thing I can say, you have to know when you have to say no. You don't have to do the camp. You don't have to burn out in making that camp happen. You have to know when, the, when you get to, so you, I think it, if you have a team, you will need to agree when is the point when you need to discuss if you want to or can do it or not. If you don't do it, there is always next year. You can do it, I don't know, in. 12 months or maybe the year after, you don't have to do it. It's, I think if, yeah, there's the thing is that the pressure is coming from, it's basically all about the money, I think. So every camp is, it's always the money. If we have enough money, I don't think that the catering is that amount of problem because people will figure it out in the end, just like they ordered the pizzas if they didn't have enough food. Um, I think that you have to learn to say no and, and you have to decide wisely when you say no. Because, for example, with Iron Camp, I think we decided like in the very last minute, but I was actually really happy that we did it because I had like very rough few weeks before saying no, and then we said, and it felt a lot better. Yeah, it's uh, not that kind of pressure. Uh, the, every every camp is a pressure in a way. It was a different kind of pressure. Um, with Drupal Auton, we don't have that. Um, we were thinking about doing it with Iron Camp, but then we never got to the point to actually think about it. 
Um, I think that, and I'm also thinking about working on something like how to get funds for camps, like non-refundable funds, that it's not sponsor money, that is actually, you can spend it on to make it actually happen. So for example, if you have a gap in your budget, you can apply for it. And uh, because it's like, yeah, all the money is coming from sponsors and the tickets, but there can be always, like for example, when you organize something for the first time, like Iron Camp, and you organize it with, I don't know, seven other countries, there is not a central money bag. And it's really hard to decide who is going to put in how much money, for example, because if we have, for example, the Hungarian Association, we have enough money. We said that we would put in some thing, like we would pick, the association itself would pick a sponsor package. But it's it's not easy. So so I think it, it's something missing that I, I think that Drupal camps would need some basic funds. But it's yeah, if your local, for example, association doesn't have any money, for example, when we yeah when we started to organize Iron Camp, the association was just like I don't know, a few months old. Of course, we didn't have any money, not even from the membership. So it's not enough to secure anything. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. No. For me, everybody's laughing at it, but I prefer I like being at the registration desk. For me that's the Yes, because this is when you can meet people. I mean, everybody comes and they, yeah, I saw you there and then you can start with people. That's my favorite part. And yeah, the end. And then you can start organizing it again. So, yeah. When you're in the middle and everything is going well, and I think, but I think it depends on your personal preference. Yes, yes, yes. I think it's supposed to be fun. You don't have to stress out on everything. Yeah, there are some situations, but no, you don't. By default, you don't. You shouldn't be stressed out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the more people you have, the better. I think it's more to have more people who, in the end, don't really have to do too many things uh, than to have, like, last year in Drupaton, I don't think we actually had any, like, volunteers, volunteers who were, who we could send to sprint room to check everything or go to the workshops. It's, it's, yeah, the more people you have. Because that, there's always someone who will need an adapter. There's always someone who you will need to turn to if the air conditioning is crazy. And if you have more pool to, like, a bigger pool to get more, like, more people from, that's the best. But I think it depends, of course, on the size. I don't know how many volunteers do we have at Dev Days. You know, maybe the number? <laughs> Officially. That's that's great. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's 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 an ideal number because then you will have coverage for everything. Um in Dev Days in Saget, I think we had like, I don't know, five or six people besides those who said that okay they will take care of the sprints. Um and we had no idea. I mean I know that for example we didn't put together a volunteer guideline document and everybody was like, so what I'm supposed to do? And then we started to explain to them. It was, we didn't have time for that. That was crazy. So, but I think that, yeah, the more people you have. I think it's, yeah, it's nice to know who's doing what. Like, for example, I'm helping with the Twitter account. Someone's helping with the room monitoring. So, you know, I don't know, you have four people who will go to sessions. You have two people who are always in the sprint rooms because they're interested in that. Then you know that they, you can find them there always or you can ask them to help. I think, yeah, roles are, are if you can decide, if you can ask them to decide what they are actually interested in, that's the best. Because in the end, they're going to do what they actually love to do. They sit at the sprints or go to the sessions to learn, but they are still there and they learn and work, I mean, help you. So, kind of work. And I think it's really useful, yeah. Okay, thank you so much.